Time to take a look at the overall strategy in early World War II concerning the Atlantic. This video will cover the fuse actions and development of the German and American side from the time of the outbreak of the war to the situation just before the German declaration of war against the United States. So let's get started. Hitler's first directive for the war concerning the German Navy was a focus on a trade war against the United Kingdom. Similarly, the commander of the German Navy, Admiral Reda, wanted to break the British economy by cutting it off from its supply lines. Yet, a prerequisite for this would have been a clear focus on the production of the necessary weapon systems to achieve this, namely submarines and airplanes. Yet, Hitler's view was different. He was focusing on a short land war in Europe and peace with the United Kingdom and thus wanted to limit an extensive attack on the British economy. Both the German Navy command realized quite early that the long war with the United Kingdom was very possible and that an entry of the United States into the war was quite certain. Radar tried several times to convince Hitler of the Atlantic nature of the war. After all, Great Britain was dependent on imports and those came to a large degree from the United States, which was likely to intervene if the United Kingdom was under serious threat. These assumptions of the German Navy command were mostly correct. In July 1940, US Congress approved the Two Ocean Navy Act, which called for a major expansion of the US Navy by around 70%. The following decision in September 1940 was to provide the British with 50 older destroyers for 8 bases. This act was interpreted as quite hostile by the German Navy. To give you some reference, at the outbreak of the war Germany had 21 destroyers. Of course, the US buildup would take time. The German Navy assumed that the US Navy expansion would begin to be an important factor from 1942 onwards. Thus a crucial success or at least a determined stand against the United Kingdom was necessary before the US would enter the war or provide further assistance to the British. Although Hitler made some concessions to the Navy, there was no general shift in strategy in the late 1940, early 1941. After all, Hitler considered the United Kingdom as a potential ally and not the main enemy. Furthermore, the preparations for the invasion of the Soviet Union were already in motion. On the other side of the Atlantic, the situation was quite different. In November 1940, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was re-elected. This guaranteed the further continuation of the close cooperation between the US and British. In December 1940, Churchill noted that the British ability to pay properly for the arms trade couldn't be sustained much longer. Soon thereafter, in March 1941, Roosevelt announced an act to promote the defense of the United States. You probably didn't heard that one before, because it is commonly known as land lease. This act allowed the support with equipment of any country whose defense the president deems vital to the defense of the United States. The British and American cooperation was continuously more formalized and got a unified strategy. This also included agreements on the cooperation for the Asian Pacific area. And probably most important, there was an agreement that Germany was a major threat and that the control of the Atlantic was crucial in winning the war in Europe. The US Navy began preparations for escorting convoys in the Western Atlantic, but Roosevelt couldn't allow the production of convoys yet due to political factors in the United States. Nevertheless, the British were allowed to repair their warships in US shipyards, which took off quite some pressure from the British shipyards. Nevertheless, the British situation was quite problematic. The monthly losses from January to April 1941 grew from 300,020 gross register tonnage to 688,000 tons. In order to counter the land lease agreement, Admiral Rader called for several actions. Yet Hitler agreed only on expanding the operational areas. As a reaction, Roosevelt confiscated all German, Danish and Italian ships in US harbors. Furthermore, in April 1941, the US occupied Greenland and expanded the security zone. Additionally, the US Navy transferred several ships from the Pacific to the Atlantic. In total, by June 1941, three battleships, one carrier, four cruisers and 18 destroyers were transferred. Yet, these transfers made it clear that the US Navy wasn't yet ready for a war. It still lacked the number of ships and personnel to provide proper convoy escort missions in the Atlantic. Furthermore, there was only a limiting backing by Congress and hence no escort operations were conducted. Yet the patrol activity within the expanded security zones was extended and the zone also clashed with the German operational areas. Thus future incidents were quite certain. The German Navy interpreted Roosevelt's actions as hostile, but was also aware of his political limitations regarding the Congress and the public opinion. 
Basically there were two approaches in the German Navy. The first one, which was favored by Admiral Rader, was to take a determined stance against any further initiative by the United States. The second one was to try to keep the United States in check by giving no reason for change in the American public opinion. Hitler wanted to prevent a conflict with the United States before the Soviet Union was defeated. After all, he assumed that it would only take several months to defeat the Soviet army. In May and June 1941 there were two incidents. In May, the US trade ship Robin Moore was sunk by a German submarine and in June a German submarine tried several times to get a proper firing angle on the battleship USS Texas. In the first case, Roosevelt didn't order the direct protection of convoys yet, but expanded the protection zone and also patrols into German operation areas. In the second case, the USS Texas was operating in an area that was clearly known as a war zone. The German Navy informed Hitler and he decided that before Operation Barbarossa any incident with the United States should be avoided. Another major step by the US in 1941 was the occupation of Iceland. Originally Iceland was part of Denmark. After the capitulation in 1940 the British occupied Iceland and in summer 1940 US forces took over. Now this was done by US Marines because they were volunteers and thus Roosevelt could act without the approval of the Congress. Now at first a base on Iceland seems like a limited move. But once you have a base somewhere you need to supply it. So US convoys that were protected by US warships were used to supply Iceland and British merchant ships were welcome to join these convoys. These joint convoy operations also served as a foundation for the future operation between the US and the Royal Navy. Quite unsurprisingly in September 1941 there was an incident about 200 nautical miles southwest of Iceland. The destroyer USS Korea and the German submarine 652 attacked each other, although both missed. Both sides assumed they were attacked by the other. Originally a British recon plane attacked the submarine with death charges and the captain assumed it was the destroyer. Roosevelt used this incident and called the German attacks piracy. Furthermore, this is the origin of his rattlesnake quote. But when you see a rattlesnake poised to strike, you do not wait until he has struck, before you crush him. These Nazi submarines and raiders are the rattlesnakes of the Atlantic. Furthermore, the speech contained a new escalation. That means very simply, very clearly that our patrolling vessels and planes will protect all merchant ships, not only American ships, but ships of any flag, engaged in commerce in our defensive waters. Both Churchill and the German Navy command interpreted this message basically the same way. Either Germany would lose the battle in the Atlantic or it had to risk to be engaged by US forces every time. Admiral Rader called it a localized declaration of war, yet Hitler was still hoping for a successful Operation Barbarossa and order to prevent any further incidents with the United States. Yet in October 1941 there were two further incidents. First, the destroyer USS Kearney was hit by a German torpedo. This resulted in the first US casualties in World War II. Roosevelt declared the intention to revise the neutrality acts, including the armament of US merchant ships and delivering goods directly into the harbors of warfaring countries. Second, in the end of October 1941, the destroyer USS Reuben James was sunk, which strengthens Roosevelt's opposition in Congress for revising the neutrality acts. Nevertheless, the final vote on changing the Neutrality Act was still a close call with only a majority of 18 votes. This showed that Congress was clearly not willing to support a declaration of war anytime soon. Meanwhile, for Germany, the situation in October 1941 was quite difficult. The army was still heavily engaged with the Soviet Union, the incidents with the United States further increased the support for the British and the situation in the Mediterranean was endangering the alliance of Italy. In order to solve the crisis in the Mediterranean, German submarines were ordered there. After all, the loss of North Africa would expose Italy. This showed already how overstretched the Axis capabilities were in late 1941. Hitler still believed he could beat the Soviet Union. And furthermore, he assumed that the Mediterranean was central for the stabilization of continental Europe. He assumed that Italy could easily collapse, thus he focused on improving German naval and air units in the Mediterranean. The low numbers of German Navy units in the Atlantic in end of 1941 is quite obvious. If one considers that after the attack on Pearl Harbor Hitler declared war against the United States, yet only six submarines were ordered against the US coast. 
To summarize, Hitler and the high command of the Navy had quite different views. Whereas the Navy considered the Battle of the Atlantic as crucial from the get-go, Hitler considered it more important to eliminate all continental enemies first. Furthermore, the main enemy for the Navy were the British, whereas Hitler wanted a peace with the British even in late 1941, although it was clear to him that Churchill wouldn't budge. Naturally, the Navy and Hitler had a different approach. The Navy wanted to take a clear stance against any escalation by the United States early on, where Hitler tried to de-escalate as long as possible in order to prevent a free front war before defeating the Soviet Union. Now the British didn't got mentioned a lot in this video, mainly due to the fact that they became a junior part of the United States and most of the initiative on a strategic level was either determined or dependent from the United States. Of course, the British still did most of the fighting in this period, but this will be part of another video, or probably series. Finally, the United States with Roosevelt was on a constant escalation course, which is usually called short of war policy. Roosevelt was mainly held back by three factors, the relatively unprepared US forces, public opinion, and of course US Congress. Yet by mid-October 1941, the public opinion was already in 70% in favor of defeating Hitler than keeping out of the war. Still, Congress wasn't willing to support the declaration of war. The attack on Pearl Harbor by the Japanese and the following declaration of war from Hitler against the United States clearly changed the situation. And the Second World War was set in full motion by the end of 1941. Thank you for watching. Please like, comment, share, and subscribe. And see you next time.